Blood Angels 10th Edition Lore Update Sons are Sanguinius. The Blood Angels are the noble and courageous scions of the Primarch Sanguinius, who is known as the Great Angel, the Bright One, the Master of Hosts, and many other titles and honorifics. In armor of rich gold, bold crimson, and mournful black, do they descend from on high into glorious battle. There do they smite the foes of the Imperium, purging the unclean, scouring the heretic, and liberating the faithful. In Sanguinius's perfect image, the malnourished sons of a ruined system are sculpted as an artist molds the great heroes of myth. They emerge from their apotheosis as mighty warriors, beautiful in form, elegance, and bearing. The stunted grow, the feeble grow strong, the sickly grow hale. This is the great angel's vision for the Imperium embodied in his sons. No matter the wretchedness of humanity's existence, it has the potential to rise anew, more wonderful than mankind itself could ever imagine. For ten thousand years has it been so, but the price the blood angels have paid for their loyalty is hideous. Sanguinius was slain by the arch-traitor, Horus, and the spiritual shock of his death would bedevil his gene sons forevermore. Few know the true cost of the great angel's demise, though it is one the blood angels pay to this day. The toll of what is known as the floor, growing greater with each passing year. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and faces of the Warhammer 40k setting. The grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. And today, we shall be taking a brief look at the new lore coming out of the 10th edition Blood Angels Codex, the Sons of Sanguinius. There is not a great deal to be said, if truth be told, but the book does contain a rather graphic example of the most important element of being a blood angel. So, as usual, let us hear the juicy weed tale from Games Workshop, then wade into the new lore a tad more at its end. To quote The Tragedy of Sergeant Cosima Sirens blared across Garani's smog-thick skies as a blazing trail of missiles rained down from orbit to detonate amidst manufacturums, refineries, and fabrication facilities. Black Legion transports roared overhead, their dark masses casting long shadows. Flak fire tracked them as they descended towards the surface, sending several spiring to a fiery demise. Others disappeared beyond the anti-aircraft missiles, into the cityscape to disgorge their troops. Brother Sergeant Cosima watched the dark vessels descending from his position on the roof of an abandoned factorum. A column of armored vehicles painted in the crimson red of the Blood Angels drove along the wide boulevard below him, heading towards the fighting at the city's heart. Vox messages blared across the cityscape, the panicked cries of planetary defense units intermingling with the binaric data streams of Adeptus Mechanicus Overseers and Scatarii Marshals. He adjusted his Vox receiver, filtering out static disruption and civilian calls for help until he could hear Lieutenant Volaris's booming voice. Squad Casima, proceed to Manufactorum Zero Magnus immediately. Black Legion forces inbound. Coordinates flashed across Sergeant Cosima's vision, projected into his mind's eye by his helmet's auto-sensors. Turning towards the indicated position, which was no more than a few hundred yards from his current location, he broke into a run and activated his jump back. Two nacelles flared, propelling him into the air and carrying him over the column of vehicles 
to land atop the buildings on the far side of the thoroughfare. His squad followed, two brothers flanking him on either side. Smoke rose from the target location, and the sound of bolt gun fire was audible above the scream of jet engines. He leapt again, crossing a narrow boulevard to land atop another of the uniformed hab structures clustered around the factorums and generatoria. A cloud of dust and splintered masonry rose from behind him, loosed by the force of his landing. Cosima crossed the rooftop in three long strides and took flight once more. From this vantage point, he could see three dropships descending to land before a towering manufactorum structure, emblazoned with the opus machina of the Martian priesthood. The transports threw out clouds of ash as they landed, their bay doors yawning wide to the scourge black armored heretics. The legionaries moved with practice, precision, and discipline, establishing firing positions as the remainder of their allies emerged from the belly of their transport. The red robed soldiery of the Adeptus Mechanicus met the disembarking invaders with volleys of galvanic fire. Yet even as heretics fell, more vessels broke through the clouds to alight beside the first. On me, brothers! We must halt their advance! bellowed Cosima over the squad's Vox Channel. Leading his battle brothers forward, he bounded over the wreckage of downed aircraft and ruined masonry, weaving through heavy bolt gun fire before taking flight once more. The ailerons upon Cosima's jump pack twitched in response to his movements, compensating for subtle changes in trajectory. He came plummeting down atop a trio of bolt gun wielding black legionaries with bone shattering force, scattering them aside and bringing his chainsaw across his body to strike the nearest foe. Such was the power of his blow that the serrated adamantine teeth of his weapon sheared through the bolt gun, breastplate, flesh, and bone of the victim. Dark blood and shards of splintered armor sprayed from the wound. Cosima kicked the stricken legionary free, sending him toppling backwards to the ground. He turned his hand flamer upon another of the warriors and squeezed the trigger. A jet of Prometheum spewed from the nozzle of the weapon, passing through its igniter and bursting into flames. The heat of the burning fuel caused armor plates to warp, flaming fluid seeping into cracks and seams, and searing the Chaos Space Marine's body. The smell of cooking flesh burned away the lingering essence of freshly spilt blood. Cosima's brothers swept past him, jet turbines propelling into the Black Legionaries, their chainswords and bolt pistols clashing with the stocks of bolt guns and the glinting edges of accursed blades. The smell of blood heightened Cosimo's senses, its coppery scent lingering in his sinuses, the metallic taste stirring something bestial within him. He swallowed hard, suppressing the rage that threatened to rise from within and overwhelm him. Brother Demetros soared past him, crashing into a wall-wielding legionary bringing his chainsaw down across his opponent's chest. Teeth chewed through ceramite, the roar of the chainsaw's engine changing to an ear-splitting whine as it hewed apart armor and flesh. As Demetros leapt backwards, withdrawing his sword from the stricken foe, Cosima raised his bolt pistol and shot the legionary in the temple. Shards of bone and brain matter flew in all directions as the body fell to the ground. Ahead of Cosima, a towering warrior clutching a curved sword pressed through the heretic's ranks. The pallid, scarred champion wore a blood-red topknot that whipped in the blazing winds of war. The chaos champion struck a vicious blow that took the head from Brother Ossian's shoulders. The warrior's severed head, encased within its crimson helm, rolled across the ground, while arterial blood spurted from the toppling corpse. The heretic bellowed in triumph, his blood-drenched weapon raised high. Cosima felt a pang of anguish at his brother's violent death. He let out a vengeful cry, triggering his jump pack's thrusters and propelling himself shoulder first into the foe. The two warriors were thrust through the skirmish, scattering aside blood angels and black legionaries alike. Together, they smashed through a low metal barricade, weapons and limbs tangled as they tumbled down a sharp embankment and landed in a shallow stream of effluent and grime. The two warriors thrashed and struck at each other as they scrambled to their feet. The traitor's bolt pistol roared once again, shell slamming into Cosima's armor. He struck back with an elbow and was rewarded with a pained grunt as his opponent felt the force of the blow. The two combatants broke apart, 
circling one another and brandishing their weapons, waiting for an opportunity to strike. Corpse worshipper, the heretic champion spat in derision, blood and spittle flying from his mouth. Just as Sanguinius died for his arrogance, so shall you. Treacherous wretch, Cosimo bellowed in reply, charging forwards. You are not fit to speak his name. The sergeant struck, slashing from left to right with his chainsword, forcing the black legionary to parry with his corrupted blade. A second strike smashed the traitor's weapon again, forcing the heretic to take a step backwards. The traitor lashed out to block a third blow, knocking Cosima's weapon aside and smashing the grip of a bolt pistol into his head. Auto sensors flickered and died, and the left lens of Cosima's helm sparked as the armor glass shattered under the force of the strike. Cosima tasted his blood and felt the fury rise again, muscles twitching, teeth gritted as he attempted to stave off the red thirst. Stepping out of his opponent's reach, he holstered his pistol and reached for his helm, popping the seal and casting it aside. A shock of sweat-drenched golden hair fell across his face. He gazed into the pitiless depths of the black legionary's jet-black eyes. Malice radiated from the ebon-clad warrior, millennia of bitterness and hatred etched upon his battle-scarred visage. The Chaos Champion came forward again, his axe a blur of motion, its accursed edge leaving behind a shimmering trail of, of infernal energy as it sliced through the air. Cosima parried the first strike, then another and a third. His opponent's savagery forced him to be more defensive. An axe blow smashed into his chainsword again, followed by a firm kick that sent him sprawling onto his back. The blade descended again, biting into Cosimo's left arm as he rolled aside. Agony flashed through him, only to be dulled as his nervous system flooded with pain suppressors. The arm had been severed below the elbow, and now lay twitching at his side. He scrambled to his feet and bared his teeth, the bloodlust surging forth once more. The champion of chaos stalked forward, a malicious smile on his face. On the ridge above, more ebon-clad black legionaries appeared, weapons drawn, and descended towards the wounded space marine. His vox was a storm of static, the voices of his brothers no longer audible. Sergeant Cosma swallowed hard. He knew he was outmatched. When grace and honor could not carry the day, what choice did he have but to embrace savagery? He took a ragged breath, savoring the stench of freshly spilt blood. No more did he try to suppress his bestial fury. Instead, he allowed it to flood his veins, embracing the curse of his lineage. The sergeant charged, bellowing in a blood-crazed fury. The Black Legionary's axe rose to meet his advance, only to be swatted aside by the wild swing of Cosima's chainsword. His taut muscles burned, the blood hunger driving him forward with rabid urgency. His strikes landed with speed and rage, adamantine teeth ground through gothic armor, splintering gilded trim and tearing loose ragged chunks of black ceramite. Freed from restraint, the red thirst empowered his every strike. His opponent faltered, his cruel smile curdling into an expression of grim hatred. All trace of arrogance wiped from his features. An overhand strike ground through the haft of the Black Legionary's weapon and into his skull. Cosima watched the life drain from his victim's black eyes, savoring the warm blood as it splashed across his face and mouth. Again and again he struck, satisfying his desire for blood with each frenzied blow. With a final scream of unfettered rage, he kicked the corpse of his victim aside. Still in the grip of fury, Cosima cast his gaze around, looking for others upon whom to vent his fury. At the crest of the hill, the Black Legionaries trained their bolt guns towards him. Red-clad figures soared overhead, descending to land at his side, the weapons caked in gore. His rage abated at the sight of his brothers, simmering beneath the surface, pleading to be called forth once more. He would need it if Garani were to hold. The curse of their blood would be a gift this day, and if the cost of victory was honor, it was a price he would be willing to pay. Brother Cosima entered the Sanguine Grace's starboard ventral docking bay at the head of his squad. Beyond him, the glowing sphere of Garani was visible through the shimmering energy shield that held the cold vacuum of the void at bay. Much of the besieged forge world's surface was obscured by smoke and ash, 
thrown up, he knew, by immense explosions. At the center of the bay, Captain Raphael stood over a long table, his palms resting upon its surface. Atop the surface, a holographic unit projected an image of the planet, replete with approximate enemy positions and flashing objective indicators. Two score blood angels clad in the crimson power armor of their ancient chapter stood in ranks in front of the display, their armor bearing the emerald blood drop of the fourth company. They held bolt rifles clasped to their chests as they listened intently to their commander's pre-battle briefing. Three Thunderhawk gunships stood ready, towering over the assembled space marines. Servitors and chapter serfs bustled around the ships, tending to the machine spirits of the eager vessels and loading heavy weapons and machinery into their storage bays. Tech marines oversaw the operations, issuing binaric instructions to their underlings, their mechadandrites and servo arms twitching. Cosima marched across the deck to join his assembled battle brothers, passing beneath the shadow of a Thunderhawk's wing. The smell of perfumed oil and incense permeated the recycled air, a scent reminiscent of the grand halls of the Arx Angelicum. Even here, within the belly of a strike cruiser, the artistry of Baal was prominent. Statues of long-dead heroes of the chapter rose in every corner of the vast chamber, reaching up to support the deck above with marble hands. Winged armorium cherubs flitted above, parchment seals trailing from their rosy flesh, bearing belts and magazines of ammunition to waiting warriors. Cosima caught the captain's eye, raising a fist over his breastplate by way of a salute. Raphael acknowledged him with a nod before continuing. Void superiority has been established, the captain said, his baritone voice drowning out the background thrum of the vessel's engines. We have retreated from this world once. We shall not flee again. We strike in six hours. Drop assaults to be preceded by precision bombardment. Glancing down at his bionic, Brother Sergeant Cosima flexed the servo motors within. The memories of defeat flooded his mind. The snarling faces of black legionaries and the mutilated corpses of his dead battle brothers, his severed arm twitching on the ground. He had given way to his fury upon that polluted orb and dishonored himself. Perhaps victory on this day would go some way towards washing away the stain. Black Legion positions have been located around the Prime Manufactura. Adeptus Mechanicus Maniples have proven unable to dislodge the invaders. Squad Cosima and Veneris are to insert behind the Black Legion fortifications. Cosima shifted uncomfortably. A strange feeling of otherness began to distract him, a fog of confusion clouding his thoughts and eroding his focus. The captain's words barely registered. A dissonance overcame him, and he felt as if he were standing above himself, observing the briefing from without. Disordered memories flickered across his mind's eye, yet contained in their midst were visions of events he could not recall, the experiences of another. Cutting through the confusion, a deep voice resonated within the recesses of his mind. Steal thyself. The traitors come. He turned his head swiftly, seeking the source of the voice, only to find his squad arrayed around him in silence. The disassociative episode ebbed away as swiftly as it had arrived, the captain's voice audible once more. Armored units will exploit the breach. The forge machines must be captured intact. The tech marines will accompany the armored assault and secure the indicated positions. Cosima struggled to regain his concentration, shaking his head and staring up at Rafin, but to no avail. He slowly squeezed his eyes closed and grimaced, a dull pain to throb in the recesses of his mind. When he opened them once more, he was no longer standing upon the deck of the Sanguine Grace. Instead, his feet were planted upon solid ground. No longer was he clad in crimson, but instead in armor of burnished gold. He held in his right hand an elegant blade, its shimmering surface crackling with power. Instinctively, he flexed a pair of angelic wings. Before him rose the stark stone walls of a colossal fortress, lined with gold-domed gun batteries. The sky blazed with gunfire, indistinct vessels wheeling across the clouds above, trace of fire and artillery crashing against void shields, 
following strikes plowing through to impact upon the outer walls and rain down into the heart of the fortress itself. A towering gate was embedded in the fortress wall, its surface embossed with images of heroes from myth. Beyond the immense wall, the clangor of battle could be heard. The death screams of combatants and the percussive thud of heavy weapons rippled through the air and shook the very ground beneath his feet. The gate moved, swinging open to reveal the violence beyond. There he was, back on the deck of the strike cruiser again. He took a sharp intake of breath, turning his head from side to side. He felt his heart racing, adrenaline throwing through his body. He felt the ashen breeze upon his face, the stench of burning flesh. It had been so real. Manufactorum District Argos. Thunderhawk Assault Wings will secure Drop Zone Cruelor. The captain's voice broke Cosima free from his vision. He shook his head, muscles tensing. At his side, his brother stirred in reaction to his movement. His vision flickered yet again. He watched Crimson Armored Battle Brothers advance into a storm of fire. The captain's voice faded, replaced by a Vox transmission, a bellowing voice that he did not recognize screaming orders. Through the gate into the breach! Drive the traitors back for their emperor! The blood angel strode forward, firing from the hip, their fusillade slamming into the mass of traitors surging through the narrow approach to the gate. Their pale armor was thick with rust and filth. To Cosima, the scene before him was as real as any battle in which he had partaken. With me, for Baal and the Emperor! Cosima found himself bellowing, though the voice was not his own. He felt the urge to join the fight, the urge to aid the blood angels around him in their struggle, yet his body would not respond. He felt the impact of a bolt round against a gilded pauldron. He started forward again, snarling loudly and raising his sword high, thunderous wingbeats propelling him at an incredible speed. Abruptly, the vision faded. Once more, he found himself standing on the deck of a void ship, his chainsaw drawn and raised. Swiftly, the Blood Angel's warriors around him parted, bringing their bolt rifles into a ready position and training them upon him. Through the crowd, the black-robed form of Chaplain Georgion strode, his skull mask focused upon Cosima. The Chaplain pressed his way towards the Sergeant. As his eyes met the gaze of the Chaplain, the Sergeant lost his tenuous grip upon the reel once more. His head pounded. More half-formed yet intense memories flashed through his mind. He felt himself stumble forward to one knee. Fire and smoke, blood and battle cries. He and his sons pressed through their gate and surged out into the storm of fire. He gazed around again. His sons were no longer with him, replaced by a score or more of Horus's sons. The eye of their traitorous Primarch embossed upon the teal plate of their power armor. They raised their bolters in unison, bellowing in the name of their traitorous lord, his brother. Rage began to boil within his veins, muscles tightened and cramping. Only the paralyzing confusion prevented him from rising to open fire and rain justice down upon them. A strong grip took hold of Cosima's augmetic arm and wrenched the chainsword from his grip. Clarity suddenly returned to the sergeant. He saw the chaplain's skull mask, inches from his face, the glowing red lenses of his superior's helm peering intently into his eyes. He tried to move, but found his body would not respond. The chaplain held aloft an ornate censer. Scented smoke emanated from its perforated shell. He waved it before Cosmo's face, the pungent incense burning his lungs as he breathed it in deeply. Brother Sergeant Cosima, breathe deeply. Do you hear my words? The chaplain said, the pity evident in his voice. The sergeant could barely move and struggled to recall his name or place his location. The faces around him were like those of strangers. Confused and disoriented, he couldn't muster a response. All he could feel was anger and sorrow. Come, Brother Sergeant Cosima, Chaplain Georgion spoke once more with pity in his voice still. The sound of his name awoke within the sergeant a moment of lucidity. He recognized the fate that had befallen him. The floor had come for him at last. He knew the signs all too well. Already he could feel his muscles begin to spasm, the taint that marred the blood of all blood angels flooding through his system. 
Your final battle is nigh, the chaplain continued. The death company beckons, brother. Cosima wanted to respond, to deny the truth, and yet he could manage no words. He simply nodded as the chaplain extended a gloved hand and rested it gently upon his forearm. It is time. Be not sorrowful, for in battle shall the stain be washed from your soul, the chaplain said, his voice a soothing whisper. The chaplain's hand tightened upon his arm, and he felt a gentle pull as he was guided through his assembled battle brothers, the raid warriors looking upon him with somber and knowing expressions. A single tear ran from the sergeant's bloodshot eyes as he left them behind, and allowed himself to be led out of the docking bay. Soon he would wear the black. The floor would fully claim his battle-damaged soul. His last hope, as he was led away into the depths of the sanguine grace, was that, when the final battle came to pass, death would find him, and he would be cleansed. The growl of engines, the grinding of steel tracks over loose rubble, the faint sound of battle cries and a constant stream of gunfire rattling against the transport's hull. These sounds were barely audible over the thunderous pounding of the Blood Angel's twin hearts. A maddening fury maintained a vice grip upon his tortured soul. He knew not where he was, nor even his own name. He ground his teeth together, muscles taut with rage. One moment he saw the faces of black-clad death company twisted into expressions of savage anger, the next the expressionless helms of red-armored blood angels. A flood of memories washed over him, the intermingling smells of incense, blood, hot promethium, and acrid smoke dredged from a mind that was not his own. He felt the vehicle grind to a halt, then tightened his grip upon his blade, eager to enter the fray. His muscles tensed as harness restraints fell away. The hatch of the Land Raider slammed down to reveal the raging battle beyond. The Blood Angel's gaze settled upon a dozen or more Chaos Space Marines, their black armor stained with blood and grime. A few raised profane banners high above their heads as they advanced through the industrial ruins over the broken bodies of Skitarii soldiers. Released, the Blood Angel let out a bellow of unadulterated fury thumbing the activation rune of his chainsword as he thundered down the ramp at the head of his squad. The booming litanies of a chaplain accompanied him as he sprinted from the transport. The Blood Angel charged towards the heretics, vision blurred, the battlefield rearranging itself. Gone were the squat manufactura, smoke-belging chimneys and howling black legionaries. In their place were the golden walls of the Imperial Palace, rising from their mountainous foundations to loom over Terra's endless sprawl. Space Marines clad in sea-green armor marched steadily forwards, bolt guns spitting death. Traitors, he thought to himself, snarling. Sons of Horus! The Blood Angel raised an carmine blade and a gilded fist, the crackling power running across its surface, illuminating his resplendent golden form. Gouges, scorch marks and craters pockmarked the plate of his armor, the results of days of continuous warfare. Bolt shells twisted past him, striking his sons and knocking several from their feet. Some of them were dead before they hit the ground. Others struggled painfully, attempting to rise to their feet, desperate to continue the fight, despite the mortal wounds that had laid them low. On, the Blood Angel charged, focused upon his own thirst for violence. Closing in on the traitors, he swept the blade in carmine through their ranks, spitting ceramide plate and spilling gore across the marble stairs. He struck again, moving with preternatural speed, piercing the breast of a foe with the tip of his sword before ripping it free. The dying warrior toppled into his brothers, preventing them from bringing their weapons to bear for a precious second. The blood angel plunged into them. A golden titan, feathered wings propelled him ever onward. He slashed right and left, shearing through ceramite with each elegant swing. Beyond the surging traitors, dark shapes descended, grime-encrusted green and white transports settling upon the ground to disgorge Mortarian's treacherous sons. The angel felt his rage intensify, tears of bitter fury running across his face. Only death awaits the traitor, the blood angel heard himself cry, burying his weapon in the neck of a traitor space marine before wrenching it free. 
Return strikes from the heaving mass of enemies rained down, biting into his armor and piercing flesh. He snarled, shrugging off the pain and lashing out with the pommel of his crackling weapon to strike the exposed face of another enemy. Suddenly, his sons were at his side, thundering past his winged form to crash into the traitors. They roared like untethered beasts as they rained blows down with reckless abandon, driving the enemy back with the sheer savagery of their advance. The traitors quailed before the ferocious assault, retreating inch by inch. The enraged blood angels pursued them, driving them back from the palace's walls and into a killing zone from which there would be no escape. The angel's rage consumed him as he flexed his wings, propelling himself into his victims, a blur of murderous violence, rushing up to consume all trace of conscious thought. All was fury. All was violence. All was death. When conscious thought returned, it did so with a suddenness that caused the blood angel to halt in his tracks. He could not tell for how long he had been lost in the slaughter, but no more did he stand before the Emperor's shining bastion. He now found himself in a wide corridor, thick bulkheads rising from dark metal decking on either side. The stone corpses of blood angels and Horus's traitorous sons surrounded him. Lying upon the blood-slick deck plates, Vacant eyes staring blankly at the ceiling. The blood angel's breathing became shallow and ragged, a dull pain emanating from his chest. He brushed a gauntleted hand across a gaping rent in his breastplate, hands closing around the hilt of a traitor's blade, and wrenching the weapon free. Another bout of confusion descended as he cast the bloodied dagger aside. His vision was fluid, continuing to shift and falter, shapes and surroundings melting away, clear memories thrusting themselves to the fore before receding as swiftly as they had appeared. One moment, he was hurtling across an ashen industrial wasteland into the midst of a group of cowled blasphemers. The next, he was soaring above traitor space marines clad in filth-encrusted white armor flecked with blood. His movements were a blur, as if he were trapped in the recesses of his mind, watching the actions of another. The only sensation he could trust was his rage, his desire to kill. He focused upon his rage. He focused upon his raw anger, channeling it into his burning muscles and using it to empower each thrust of his blade. The Blood Angel saw black-clad Battle Brothers charging through a wide trench, hurtling towards a trio of grotesque and mutated heretics. The monstrosities bore the remnants of power armor, split open to reveal heaving masses of demonic flesh their arms terminated in chitinous blades and grasping pincers. A bolt round crashed into his right arm, causing a flash of pain. The blood angel gritted his teeth as he looked down to assess the damage. The sight of the metallic limb gripping the glowing weapon sent a ripple of shock coursing through him. Another burst of fragmented recollections invaded his mind. Black armor, the taste of blood, a twitching limb encased in blood-red armor, and rage began to boil once more within him. At the Blood Angel's side, a skull-held chaplain raised his crozius arcanum, a booming litany emitted from his vox grill. We are vengeance made manifest. We are fury unbound. None shall stay our wrath. The chaplain's skeletal visage turned upon the Blood Angel, his judgmental glare piercing his soul. Forward, Cosima. Visit vengeance upon them. Earn your place at Sanguinius' side. Let no heretic flee this place, the chaplain growled. The name meant nothing. Sergeant Cosima was no more. The blood angel broke the chaplain's gaze and turned to face the enemy, roaring a challenge to all that could hear. He broke into a run, the trench around him reforming into the blood-stick corridor of a void ship. The possessed filth were gone. In their place, were a trio of warriors clad in Terminator armor, leather paturages trailing from their black plate, the energy fields of their lightning claws shimmering and crackling. The angel swatted a crackling claw aside with his incarmine weapon, dodged another blow, kicked out with his right foot, and slammed a fist into the helm of his foe. The Terminator stepped back, fending off his furious blows and striking back, knocking the angel's sword arm aside with the claws upon its right gauntlet, and driving those on its left into his shoulder. Blood ran free, yet he felt no pain. Raw aggression kept the angel moving, despite his wounds. 
He lunged to strike again, in carmine blade biting into his opponent's right forearm. He struck again, thrusting the weapon through the gut of his foe. The crackling blade drove through the ceramite plate, sizzling as it parted flesh and organs. He drew the weapon back, and a torrent of viscera erupted from the rent in the traitor's armor as he fell. Surviving sons rallied to the angel's side, pouring down the corridor to fall upon the two remaining Terminators. Some were cast aside, their ceramite armor pierced and shredded by claws wreathed in glowing energy. Others rained blows down upon the traitors, bearing them to the ground and tearing at them with chainswords and gleaming power swords. Stepping over the body of the dying traitor, the angel advanced upon the last of the hulking trio, who was already engaged in combat with two of his sons. As the angel gazed upon the towering foe, a wave of revulsion washed over him. Terminator armor, blazing eyes affixed to its colossal bulk, cruel talons raised high, dripping with the blood of his sons. The walls closed in around him, the hum of void shields vibrating the ground beneath his feet. With a wordless cry of vengeful fury, he propelled himself forward, wings sprayed wide, blade raised for the kill. The traitor met his charge, freeing a clawed gauntlet and plunging it deep into the angel's breastplate. As the weapon ripped through flesh and vital organs, the blood angel's perception of reality warped once more. He looked down upon his armor to see a serrated, clawed limb buried deep within his black armor. His own blade was buried hilt deep in the breast of his foe, where seconds before he had seen a towering terminator. Now he was faced a mandible with a mutant monstrosity, its hate-filled eyes glassing over as the demonic possessor abandoned the mortal host to its fate. The foe toppled backwards, serrated chitinous claws slipping free from the Blood Angel's armor. He stumbled to his knees, internal organs damaged beyond the ability of even his physiology to repair. The piled corpses of black legionaries littered the ground, the warriors of the Death Company overrunning the traitor's positions. He slumped sideways, falling to the floor. As the lifeblood drained from his shattered body, he observed his brothers thunder towards the traitor's lines, bellowing the battle cry of their forefather. As the cold embrace of oblivion closed around him, Brother Cosima heard once more the chaplain's cries bellowed above the furious din of the ongoing slaughter. By the blood of Sanguinius, victory shall be ours this day. End quote. Ah, the Blood Angels. As everyone knows, they are one of my favorite factions in the game. It is their broken heart, their fall from grace, their undeserved debasement that fills the heart and mind of so many of their vast player base. For the Sons of the Angel hold a unique place in the setting. They are as noble as they are cursed. And this means that theirs is an unenviable position, far worse than any other Astartes in the Imperium. Oh, the Dark Angels may believe that they, so to put it, have it rough. Their nasty little secret being a cause for deep concern. Yet does this even come close to comparing to the burden placed on the shoulders of the Sons of the Angel? For as we have heard, every last moment is a struggle to retain control, to prevent them from giving in to the darkness that was foisted onto their very souls. Unfair. It is a curse that strips them of their greatest strength. Their grace. And without the angel to protect and guide them, as he did with the Legion so many millennia ago, they face this daily struggle almost alone. Although the blood are some of the Marines with the strongest, almost familial ties of all, they must face the dual curse of the Red Thirst and the Black Rage tantamount to alone. And Dante, their lord, oldest of all space marines still active, knows this bitter duty far deeper than most, for he had been at the very edge of despair for so very long. Now he has watched his firstborn brothers slaughtered, his world assailed, its people butchered, consumed by high fleet leviathan. The warrior who has fought so long that he has wished for death, even he, 
for to wage war against the forces of chaos and Xenos abound, over a thousand years or more, has ground away at even his noble soul. But we shall discuss him further in the future. Now with his chapter and legion smashed, he rebuilds with the Primaris technology, but he does so at a distinct disadvantage, and one that I feel leaves a very nasty taste in my craw. For the Lord Protector, that paragon of virtue, the Avenging Son, Rebute Gilliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines, has gifted him a poison chalice indeed. The Primarch forged away across the Kikatrix Maledictum, the rent across the galaxy, and he did indeed save Baal and the Blood Angels. Yet, then he dumped half of the Imperium onto the shoulders of Dante, a place where the Astronomicon does not shine, a place where warp terrors, chaos marines and corsairs of nearly every stripe run rampant in a segment of the universe that is utterly the same as that which was endured for the age known as Old Night where humanity was nearly destroyed. Here Dante calls out into the night and raises his banners on Baal, and all who hear his call flock to this one Bastille of light. Yet Dante has not the crusade fleets of the Primarch, he has not the production capacity of Mars, or most of the powerful forge worlds which are all in the brighter side. He does not have the 10,000 to spatter across his forces to help hold their morale he has not the power or mind of a Primarch to make this Herculean task manageable or even possible. All while Rebute takes the light side of the Imperium with terror. The High Lords, the vast majority of the Space Marines and stable defensive systems. Rebute has apparatus to make his will law and see his diktat spread wide. He has the production capacity, the armories, the forge worlds, the war and garrison worlds from which to draw his forces. And he can communicate across his half of the galaxy. Dante has none of this. He has no support structure, no administration, no powerful bases, forge worlds he can contact easily, or even another brother wandering around crushing his enemies before they've even raised their banners. For the lion goes where he wilt and he slays who he must. But he is certainly not at the beck and call of Dante, if he is even in regular contact. Hence the lion can be all but ignored, as surely his wanderings take him into the realm of his brother or so. So the Blood Angels have been given honor, greatly, with the trust placed in their rule. Dante must now face the Arcs of Omen and the forces of Abaddon, without any of the advantages Gilliman sits on like an overblown hut, like Jabba. Shame! I say shame unto Gilliman! For surely, if any should be on terror to control the easier and more stable side of the Imperium, then surely it should be a man and not a god. But he, a living Primarch, a son of the Emperor, and the one much touted as the best in his own mind, I am sure, Yet he has given the harder task to a mere man, an Astartes without doubt, and probably the best man who is alive in this period. But a man, while Rebute Gilliman lords it over the brighter side of the Imperium, if he had even a shred of honor, he would swap their positions immediately and take the light of his crusade into the darkness of Imperium Nihilus. This above all other things, beyond even the Imperium Secundus, is why I have so little regard for the big blue coward. For he saw the pain and misery of an entire swathe of the galaxy, and he walked away. He walked away, and I will never forget it, never forgive. And no other Blood Angel player should do either. Rebute Gilliman, Avenging Son. Even now, after 10,000 years, you show you are your father's son. Toodaloo.